Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Hey, Miguel Iterate, back here on the Lights Out podcast. Uh, I am back, as always, with the MMA detective, Mike Davis. Chris uh, Lytle is off in bare knuckle land, but we are on assignment. The king of rock and rumble is with us. Elvis Sinisic, all the way from Australia, has joined us. Elvis, how you doing? I'm good, thanks. Great to be on here with you guys. And uh, always remember, it's uh, good to be the king. Good to be the king. <laughs> Mike, go. All right, so Elvis, when you look at MMA pioneers, oftentimes their records are a little bruised. But when you examine them, because the talent pool wasn't as deep in regards to amount of participants, the people that you fought were all pretty much savages. Like I, you don't have too many easy fights on your record. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, uh, for sure. I was kind of in a difficult situation, not only because the, the sport was relatively new. And as you said, um, not a large amount of people willing to kind of take that risk and throw themselves in. So they didn't, I mean, back then it was also known as no holds barred and, um, you know, it was sold as two men enter and one man leave. So it, it had that, uh, definitely that danger appeal to it. But I kind of had a little bit more difficult situation because there also wasn't a lot of money in the sport. There wasn't big name sponsors. Um, the pay-per-views were not making a lot of money. And, you know, for a while, um, the sport was almost underground. Living in Australia so far from where a lot of these events were happening, it was very difficult to even get over into events. I even had um, about a two-year break from when I kind of started to where it kind of picked up momentum simply because a lot of pro promoters would contact me and say, well, look, we'd love to get you out. Then they'd look at the cost of the flights for me in a corner and they go, look, we'll get back to you a little bit down the track and we've got a bit more money. So when they did eventually get me over, it was no, they, they weren't interested in undercard fights or building up my record. They're like, if we're going to fly you from Australia, you're going in the deep end. And uh, sadly, um, I was the sort of guy that I was kind of doing it for the challenge. I wasn't doing it to make a career. I never really thought of it as being a pioneer. For me, it was just about challenging myself. I first got into the, the fighting because I just wanted to see whether I had the courage and the skills to survive in there. Um, and then it kind of just turned into more of a personal challenge to kind of to see how much I could improve and um, what sort of obstacles I could overcome. Can I, so, let, so let me ask you, when you came onto the world scene, you were known for your jujitsu, but it's kind of, a, a, you know, Australia comes from, Brit you know, the British heritage and, you know, it's boxing and brawling and, you know, like the tough bloke is a thing, you know what I mean? Um, how did you become like a real, like a martial artist kind of like in that environment and, and, and gravitate towards jujitsu? How'd you get there from, uh, from being a kid? Well, Australia has a very uh, strong kickboxing Muay Thai kind of history. Um, and it all kind of built off the traditional martial arts, karate and taekwondo, kung fu, which had kind of come into the country. Uh, when I was younger, I was a Bruce Lee fan. As you can see, I've got my um, Bruce Lee-inspired uh, King's Academy jacket. There's the, the logo. Uh, so I was a big fan of, of Bruce Lee. So, you know, as most of the kids in my era used to kind of watch him and look up to him, and I wanted to get into martial arts. And I actually started with um, judo because it was the only martial arts that was around. And, you know, as a kid, you don't know any better. And so parents go, well, this is at the primary school. Off you go do the, the, the judo classes. So I did that and um, it was kind of funny. I really enjoyed the grap because I was a tall, a skinny, lanky kid. I enjoyed the grappling, but I struggled with a lot of the throws and stuff just because I was, you know, as, as a teen, you're kind of uncoordinated. And when you're lanky, it's even worse. So I enjoyed the grappling and I did that for a few years. But then when I went to um, high school, I got the opportunity to kind of to branch out a little bit more and look for um, a few other martial arts, I was looking for a Kung Fu, couldn't find anything, found a Taekwondo school, um, which was, you know, kind of selling itself as Korean Kung Fu. And I'm like, oh, well, that's 
it's got to be pretty similar. So I started training with that. And obviously in Bruce Lee's movies, he does do a lot of kicking and stuff. I'm like, oh, these guys do lots of kicks. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And I kind of went the traditional route doing the, um, uh, the Taekwondo for many years. And then I kind of had a bit of a break while I went to university. And then when I graduated, I met a high school friend who um, we would end up working at the same business. We're working for a government department in the IT. And he comes up to me, goes, here's a tape of, um, you, uh, of you, this, this event called UFC. And it was at the time UFC 2 with Boyce Gracie on it. So I kind of, I'd already kind of discovered the Gracies through John Will because he was writing about it in Blitz magazine. But even then, I'm kind of like, oh, what is this kind of Gracie jiu-jitsu stuff, this grappling? And then I watched UFC 2, and I'm like, oh, now I understand. And because I had that kind of connection to um, the, the Nawaza or the groundwork from judo, I'm like, oh, I think I'd enjoy this. So I started looking for a school. And at the time, in Canberra, there wasn't any. The closest I found was uh, a Jun fan school. So they did a little bit of grappling, a little bit of stick work, Kali a screamer and then they did a little bit of Muay Thai so it's a little bit of everything and because I had the um, Taekwondo background the, the Muay Thai came easily the grappling um, came easy because of the, the Nawaza and I'll be honest the level wasn't very high so I kind of took to it pretty well um, and I did that for a while until I kind of ended up moving to Sydney and then finding a, a jiu-jitsu school uh, Anthony Lange uh, who's been my coach for a long time now I uh, started training with him, um, and that's kind of what got me into uh, the grappling scene. I have a tendency to speak, so if you need me to stop, let no, me no, know. No, no, because I was already going into the next stage, and I'm like, wait, you only asked me how they get into grappling. All right. So let's let's talk about UFC two. If that's the event that turned you on to mixed martial arts, in my opinion, in regards to combat sports in a cage, UFC 2 is possibly the most brutal, most savage event ever put on, on, on TV. Yeah, it was pretty uh, violent. Uh, and I kind of, uh, look, I was a, uh, as a young man. I, it kind of uh, was quite um, thrilling to watch. Um, and as I said, it wasn't about, it was more about, for me, when I kind of, wanted to do it it was about um testing myself well, you know i wanted to know i'd be able to know that i could protect myself and then you know in the back of my mind i'm like if i get married and have a family can i defend my family and all that sort of stuff so um i, I wasn't looking to kind of make a career out of it yeah just kind okay. of, i liked what i saw in regards to hoist gracie and, and the skills he demonstrated able to overcome such big strong guys with his grappling that's what kind of drew me to the grappling um and it wasn't until i kind of got in there that things kind of changed and um i wanted to do a little bit more okay uh, you, so you mentioned uh, uh andrew langy as your jiu-jitsu coach Anthony, Anthony, yes. Anthony, uh, yeah. and i apologize for that i was gonna ask who who's his uh jiu-jitsu coach who's his jiu-jitsu coach like the brazilian that your chain comes from so um we come from the machado brothers so anthony langy was training under john will um so i was under anthony under john for many years and then eventually i got to uh meet carlos machado uh personally and then i ended up going and um training with him in texas uh numerous times and he's actually now become my coach directly so even though anthony langy was my first real jiu-jitsu coach and it was under John Will, Will Machado here in Australia and I still um, participate in the organization. I'm still a part of the association but my now direct coach is um, Carlos Machado and he's the one that grades me. Miguel, a side note, Carlos Machado, flat earther. He's my favorite Machado. That's all <laughs> I'm saying. That's my favorite one. I, I will one. say that I, I did get him onto the carnivore diet so yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. So one of the most interesting, I should, there's a couple of different things in your career that take place that are incredibly fascinating. And your first fight, March 22nd, 1997, you fought in Australia's first NHB event. Do you remember what it was called at the time? Oh, of course. It was the Australasian UFC. 
Uh, until hey, they got hey, 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 listen to until that. They got Australasian, Australasian UFC. UFC. Yeah. So the Australia and um, it's basically the Oceania region. That's kind of how they refer to it. Australasian UFC yeah. until they got served legal papers by SEG. And then when they released the actual VHS tape, it uh, changed to Caged Combat 1. All right. So <laughs> there's a promoter for, there's a guy from the United States that moves, Randy Babble is his name, yeah, moves Randy to Australia. Babel. So he's an expat from here. The internet isn't kind of what it is. So he knocks off all of the UFC logos, takes ads out in various magazines and publications. And, and that it's so gets people got me on it. Got people from all over the world to bite, including Mario Sperry. They legitimately thought this was the actual UFC coming to Australia. And he gets sued, but still does the event under the name. Until he releases it on the, the VHS. He didn't cease and desist immediately. Right, right. <laughs> so, this is fantastic. So, so take this, was it real professional? Were there weigh-ins? Because this sounds, like this sounds crazy in compared to today's day and age. Well, it, it Okay, no weigh-ins because it was an open weight tournament. So why would you have a weigh-in? Um, it was quite well done, um, but we also faced a lot of legal issues, not just from the US, but from um, the, the Combat Sports Authority. I'm not even sure what it was called back then, but the, um, the Government Sporting Association, the Boxing, yeah, that's right, Boxing Commission, uh, the, the police, the government, they wanted to shut it down. Um, so they're kind of like, you can't run this event because you've got to be licensed, blah, blah, blah. So what he did is in all the contracts, you had to actually state the martial art you did. You couldn't mention boxing, kickboxing or wrestling anywhere in it. So I was a judo player and Mario is Brazilian jiu-jitsu and then the kickboxers were karate people. So it was marsh, it was uh, it was sold as a martial arts again event, martial arts style versus martial arts style. Um, they literally had police outside the venue just waiting to get the call to shut it all down. Somehow it ran. It it kind of got through. Um, it was actually as I said it was pretty well done. Um, he did um, video montages, uh, interviewed us beforehand. Um, we had kind of like a, a mini press conference, which no press actually turned up to. Um, well, there was quite a bit of bad press leading up to oh, it. Though, yeah, there was a lot, of, a lot of bad press. No one really, because it was the, the cage fighting to the death, the uh, brutal. You guys know what, you guys went through it in the US. Um, yeah. And this is one of the reasons I kind of, um, had such a great relationship with the UFC because I kind of hit that at the ground floor running. So I'd had that experience with the media and thankfully being relatively well-spoken coming from an academic background, I was able to handle a lot of the questions and issues that kind of arose. So because of that, I developed a very good relationship uh, with the UFC. But anyway, this event um, was well done. It was it was the first rep cam. I don't go, guys, if you remember that. They had dancing girls uh, in there as well, in between uh, the fights. So it was, uh, it was a, definitely a spectacle and, and a show. And, uh, oh, look, I have to say, it was a great experience. Like, I, I can't knock it because it, it got, got me to where I am today. Well, I, I got to ask you, I, I remember getting this, the, the, getting the videotape delivered, you know, weeks later or whatever. But how much did you get paid? What was, what was the payday like? Shoot. Um, I got look, it. Honestly, I don't think it was a much. I think it was. It was twenty five thousand winner take call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for me, I think it was something like a thousand dollars or something to fight or so. Or and then you got um like a thousand dollars or five thousand. I really don't remember. It wasn't much. It was like you got a small purse. Oh no, that's right. You only got it if you won. That's right. You had to yeah. win your fight. Uh, 
or maybe yeah it, it, it really wasn't much I, I as i said i wasn't doing it for a career i wasn't doing it for the money i just had seen the ufc wanted to get into the ufc cage it was about a personal challenge uh, to test myself to test my courage how would i handle someone standing across from me who wanted to rip my head off um and then would my skills hold up so I really don't remember the financials much because I didn't pay much attention to it. But it really, it wasn't much. I mean, I guess it, back at that time, a thousand bucks was a lot of money anyway. So I'm not going to yeah. complain. So, the bar tab that night. <laughs> so they said there's about 5,000 people in attendance. The police were outside. Yep. I have to assume as the promoter, this had to take years off of his life. He, he formed like a fake commission in order to kind of get around the system. I mean, this guy used every loophole possible and had a set of balls doing it and pulled it off. And, and it gets worse after that as well. <laughs> now, uh, this was your first view. This was, I remember the big deal about the tournament with Sperry, obviously, yeah. but uh, you you faced Chris Hazeman too. If anybody's got a claim to be like- oh, wait, hold up, hold up, here we go, here we go. No, Mike. Come on, dude. Come on, Miguel. All right. So your first fight is actually a Lions Den member, Matt Roca. Yes. Okay. He's from Canada. Do you remember what Lions Den faction he's from? And what were your were you concerned going into this based on uh, where his lineage yeah, is? Look, uh, I, I didn't know much. I, I knew who was Lions Den going into it. That's about it. Um, it wasn't until, obviously, I got to the event that I saw someone who would turn up again in my career, Frank Shamrock, in his corner. Um, I think there's a photo somewhere where I'm punching Matt and there's um, Frank looking through the cage with <laughs> his sad face. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I knew it was lying down. I knew what their um, skills were. I, I knew that he would be looking for leg attacks. Um, I was one of the few Australians that actually uh, liked leg locks and I was actually actively trying to learn them and add them to my game. I'm not sure if you're aware, but I actually uh, won with the first ever heel hook in ADCC uh, history. So I like, it was something that I was familiar with that I wasn't worried about. And I already had a strategy that if he attacked uh, my leg, how I would defend it. And well, the results kind of speak for themselves. So 41 seconds, you get your first stoppage. It's an eight-man tournament, so you got to fight three times. Was there an adrenaline dump, issues in the oh, locker room? Amazing. Like, the adrenaline dump happened before I even got into the cage. Like, uh, oh. this is this is pretty much um, what got me into it. It's like, I, like, obviously, you're nervous. I don't know what to – I know what to expect, but I don't know what to expect. And I'm walking out there for the first time. And, you know, we got a mini Gracie train, a couple of my coaches. And then the crowd just starts cheering and chanting. And that was just, it was amazing. Like, like I'm getting tingles now remembering. It was just the most amazing experience walking out there, having this, you know, 5,000 people. I'd been to grappling tournaments with, like 20 people in the crowd, you know, it's just no one did grappling back then. Um, <laughs> and then to, to walk out and there's, you've got these, these 5,000 people just screaming and chanting my name. And, and I'm like, whoa, this is insane. But one of the most um, vivid memories is I, I still remember all this. I walk into the cage and I'm standing across um, from Matt. I can't remember if he came in for first or second. I just remember that we're both in there. I'm kind of looking across at him. I, I can see, I can hear and see everyone around me. And then the gate I, is just this re resounding clang, like metal on metal, just this vibrating clang. It shuts out and all the sound just goes. It just, it's almost like it disappeared. And my vision just goes. And all I see is Matt standing in front of me. It was one of the most intense um, things I'd ever felt. And it's one of the, the reasons it kind of drew me back because it was the biggest rush. And that I, 
And that's uh, like the adrenaline dump at that moment was crazy. Like I had it walking out, but I don't know why that clang just really cemented everything, drove everything home and made me realize it was do or die. <laughs> um, thankfully, you know, I came out on top. Um, you know, I, I knocked Matt out with the ground and pound um, or TKO'd him. Again, with my strategy, I knew he'd be attacking for the legs. The goal was to get heavy on the leg, posture and punch down. Um, and I actually ended up um, catching up with Matt, not in person, but uh, on social media online years later. And um, he was a great guy, really nice guy. And we, we still connect every now and then, which is pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, sure. So another little caveat to this, Zane Frazier was supposed to be in this tournament. Correct. He and his corner catch a flight to australia and then he pulls out day of so do you guys know what happened to him that's what that's our question okay so zane again was one of the ufc guys he turned up um to the event he was there the day before and then he's in sydney so he's like you know i'm gonna do a little bit of i'm gonna go out and just do a little bit of exercise just to loosen up and he goes down to bondi beach and then just goes for a, a, a run, like not a particularly vigorous run, just a, a good paced run down Bondi Beach and pops an Achilles. Just a freak, steps the wrong way, Achilles goes. Um, and he's just like, he's out. So uh, interesting story was um, there was another guy, um, Neil, who was, me, me and Neil had competed against each other before um in a grappling tournament he actually ended up beating me so on my resume i didn't have a lot of goals um but i had a couple but you know it's for some of the bigger ones um he actually uh beat me so going into the event so i'll give you a bit of backstory when they first announced as you said they were hitting up everyone like they'd hit up you know these big name japanese fighters they were telling us i was talking to you know um randy and I contacted him, sent him my resume. <clears throat> you talking about Randy Babble. Randy Babble. Randy Babble. Yes, okay. yes, that's right. And again, you know, compared to some of the people in there, the, the resume wasn't the best resume in the world. Like, because I, I wasn't coming from a big co competitive background, I was more, I used to compete just for personal. Um, but you were like, like, you, know, you, I, were like a, gold, gold you were like a gold You were like a You were like a pro volleyball player, correct? Yes, pro volleyball, beach, beach so volleyball. So essentially, you're just a beach volleyball player making the transition. So yeah, your resume. Well, I'd been doing martial arts longer than I'd been doing volleyball. So it, okay. martial arts was something I'd been doing for a while. It was, you know, something um, I, I think, you know, kids today should definitely use. Um, it, and it, it was, it just became part of my life, but I was not, never kind of considered looking at it as a career or, um, for, for competition or to, I used to compete um, because it was about self improvement. But anyway, so I, you know, I sent my resume and I called Randy, hey, and he, I'm going, look, I'm keen to fight. He, and Randy's going, look, I've got your resume. Um, we've got a lot of big names already lined up. You know, we're talking to, you know, um, Japanese fighters. We've got, you know, Mario coming from Brazil. We've got, you, you know, Zane from the, um, UFC in the US and you know we've got some really big plans and I'm like and they were going to have alternate fights because I don't remember I don't know if you remember I'm sure you guys know but back in the day they used to have alternate fights so you wouldn't actually ever see the alternate fights but these guys would fight off and then the winner would be in the the wings waiting um, for their opportunity to step in if someone uh, pulled out and, you know Steve, Steve Jenham a good example ended up winning a tournament because of that and stepping in. So he goes, look, I've got too many big names. I'm going to put you in uh, as an alternate fight. And I'm like, look, that's cool. And I pretty much rang him every day. I'm going, has anyone pulled out? You know, has anyone pulled out? And he's like, no, no, look, I'll, I'll call you. And I'm like, hey, I'm just checking. How's it all going, you know? Uh, and I was kind of annoying. And then um, about two weeks before the event, um, he, I've gotten a call from Randy. He goes, look, um, 
the, the Japanese fighters that we'd had lined up have pulled out. Um, we need uh, another fighter. I've contacted Neil, but he wants to stay as the alternate. He goes, would you be interested in stepping in straight into the tournament? And I go, I haven't been calling you every day not to. I'm like, absolutely, 100%, put me down. So I, I kind of got my shot. And then, as, I met, as, as you brought up, Zane Frazier popped his um, Achilles, and that's when Neil got the opportunity to, and he ended up, instead of being an alternate, jumping straight into the tournament as well. And that's yeah. Australian Neil body coat, right? That's correct, yes. Right. So your second match, I mean, you have one match under a minute, which for your first fight is pretty insane any week. It's your adrenaline dump. You're, you're pretty much spent regardless. And then you fall in line with fellow countrymen, um, Chris Hazeman. Yes. Yeah. So Chris obviously was, um, we kind of knew he was a, a grappler. He'd already been fighting in rings. Uh, in Japan. I know they also do work as well, well as real matches. Um, so I wasn't sure to what degree he, he what skills he kind of had. I just know he'd been fighting over there. Obviously, without there, there was no internet, no YouTube, no bit shoot. There was no um, Twitter or Facebook where we could find videos or content. It was all, you had to try and find VHS tapes and tape trades. So I hadn't had hadn't actually found any footage um, of Neil. I'd only just uh, sorry of Chris. I'd only just seen um, photos of him in the magazines, and I knew he was a um, big, strong, jacked um, Australian. Like he was a large individual. But you know, I, I went in there knowing that. And, um, I'd already watched the UFC, so I kind of knew what to to kind of expect. Um, and I went in there, um, guns blazing. Um, I, I did very well for the, the first part of um, the match. I felt I matched him with his grappling. Um, you know, I had his back at one point. Uh, he had me mounted for a moment, and he actually went for a chin in the eye. Um, and while I was fresh, I'm like, you're, not, you're never going to get this. And I'd, I'd been aware that I think it was... Um, was it Bob Chenchen or one of the other ring spiders had done it in one of the, the ring shows or one of, sorry, one of, one of the Russian fight shows. So I'd kind of heard about the move and I'm like, oh, that's dirty. And he tried to do it early in the round. And I kind of um, rolled out of it, got out of it, kept scrambling and wrestling. And then I think the match went about four minutes. And um, after the adrenaline dump and I'd never fought like this before, whereas, you know, Chris had done 10, 10 minute matches in, in Japan. And so obviously his cardio and um, his nutrition and supplement Peace. plan was, yeah. um, was ahead of mine. So he was, you know, well prepared <laughs> and I started to gas out. Um, and so, you know, I kept fighting and then I slowly losing position. He ended up mounting me and going for the chin in the eye again. And I knew how to get out of it, as I'd already got out of it once, but it's very different once you start getting exhausted. So instead of doing the smart thing and then just trying to escape, um, I turned to the ref to go, hey, ref, he's eye gouging. And that actually helped him get his chin in even deeper. And the ref is just kind of stepped, step, I can't remember if he said anything or stepped back, but he let it go on. Um, and so by the time I realized the, the pressure was like crazy, so I ended up uh, tapping from it. Um, I, I still feel it was a breach of the rules because one of the rules was no eye gouging. It does, didn't actually state no eye gouging with the fingers, um, but they claimed that a chin, a chin in the eye isn't eye it's gouging. It's an orbital bone. Yeah, they're saying it's like an orbital bone type thing, right? Yeah. And I'm like... Yeah. Come on, like, all right. And so they actually ended up changing the rules. And I think they, they called it like no ape hitting or something. So you can't put any any limb inside any orifice um, <laughs> for the final. Um, and interestingly enough, I actually went out to the back to ch chat to Mario uh, to wish him good luck for the final because he had Chris in the final. And um, Mario didn't speak 
speak very good English. But he looked at me and goes, like this. And I'm like, oh, okay, no problem. And then I understood this afterwards because he actually stuck his thumb in uh, Chris's eye during the match. And uh, he told me afterwards, he goes, that's for you. Um, mm-hmm. uh, obviously, the ref, the ref slapped it off. But, um, yeah, that was, that was kind of uh, a funny moment when I was uh, kind of watching. Uh, watching the footage afterwards because I didn't actually see that during the match. Um, but when I got the tape afterwards, I caught it in the wrap. I'm like, oh, that's what he meant. That's for you. That's yeah, um, so Mario Sperry yeah. wins the tournament against Chris. And yeah. um, that's, that's, that's heady territory. Being that he's a fellow countryman, was there bad blood between you two over this? Oh, no, not really. Like, I was annoyed for a while over it. But a fight's a fight. You know, I lost. I was. I think um, <clears throat> the, the press and the fans made more of a kerfuffle about it. Like, don't get me wrong. If you brought it up, I would state that I, I thought it was cheating. Because in my opinion, you know, an eye gouge, an eye gouge. But if the officials say it wasn't, then I can't really argue it. Like, I don't blame him. He was manipulating the rules to, for his benefit. You know, it is what it is. And I look, I lost, I lost the match because of it. Um, after that, I kind of really didn't care. So I ended up, uh, he ended up actually taking me over to Japan to, to compete in rings. I know I was getting set up for the, the number one guy. But he kind of pretty much alluded to that anyway. So it's not like okay. um, he was doing the dirty or anything like that. He just goes, it's a great opportunity. You know, just be aware you're going in. Um, he didn't say lose, but you're going you're in. You're going as the opponent. Yeah, you're going yeah. as the opponent. So at this, at this time in Australia, it's, there's a lot of people pretending to be things that they're not. So you had mentioned Sydney, Australia. That's where you were based out of at this point. Am I yeah, correct? Yeah. So in Sydney, Australia, there was a fake black belt that opened up a school, LB Bagunda. Do you remember that? Don't, don't remember him. Don't. Oh, um, a lot of people showed up over at his gym. I figured you had to yeah, have been yeah. one of them. No, nah, I, I think I heard, I heard about it. I didn't actually um, turn up. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I think it was someone that was a blue belt in Brazil or something, and then I, cause I heard something about it, and then his coach said he could wear a black belt in Australia because no one would know the difference, or something like that. It was yeah, there was some strange kafab. I, I I didn't get involved in that sort of stuff. But yeah. interestingly enough, you, you do bring up um, strange stuff going on. So after the the event. Um, in um, Sydney with the, the, the cage combat or Australasian UFC, um, Randy was looking at doing another event. World so, Cage Combat 2 was supposed to take place September 27th, 1997. Yes, but before he did that, no, sorry, you're right. That was supposed to take place and I was actually supposed to fight Tom Erickson. They actually lined, they lined me up to fight Tom. And I'm like, okay, I agree to it. Like, I'd, I'd seen Tom and um, Murillo Bustamante. I knew that Tom was a beast and <laughs> it, wasn't, it was probably going to be, even if I won, it wasn't going to be a pretty fight for me. Oh, um, um, love Tom. Uh, took He's the fight 400 up. pounds. He's 400 pounds that moves like a 185 pound fighter. Well, I thought he was around 300. You know, come on. Give me he's, a over <laughs> he's over three. He's over three. I'm exaggerating, but he's the, over three. The amount of times I got told someone else's weight isn't what it really was. Yeah, we won't get there on that. <laughs> the huge anyway, guy. Uh, huge yeah, guy. Oh, he's a monster. Monster. Um, so I was supposed to um, fight for that, but then Randy because he was going to take it up to Townsville because he kind of thought there's an army base up there that he would draw on um, the soldiers to come and watch because he thought he'd get a really good um, response in the in the crowd. Um, I have no idea. I'm assuming it was a lot of financial stuff that he wasn't able to pull it off. 
But in 98, instead of, because he didn't uh, pull this event off, he ended up running um, the Australian Ballet Tudo Open. So basically it was just for Australians and, and, and pretty much MMA, uh, no holds barred. But now my understanding is he hadn't paid quite a few people in the previous um, event as in not not the athletes, as in like um, I think the cage person or some of the other people. Um, so he couldn't get the cage again. Or <laughs> it, it also may have been that the the, uh, the boxing commission weren't going to let the cage happen. I don't know what, but <clears throat> instead, when we turn up to the event, it's an octagon ring. But. This is where it's crazy. Instead of a normal <clears throat> ring rope, it's chain. <laughs> it's, so you know when you hit chain, it doesn't flex. No, it doesn't um, hurt. <laughs> yeah, and so he'd put this up, and I was ready to pull out of the event. Like I'm like, wait, wait, wait let's it? let me let me set the table on this for everybody home. It's it's so you go to Rings Japan October 14th, 1997. You oh, fight. Yeah. Kiyoshi Tamura, and then yeah. you wind up back in Australia, November 16th, 1997, Australia Valley Tudo. Same promoter, different name. From what I gather, the UFC lawsuit costed him a quarter of a million dollars, and he was broke. He had that, zero that, that money. Well, so I did, Starts I didn't know another that. company. You do an eight-man tournament there, so go ahead. I apologize. Yeah, no, no, no. All good. I, I didn't want to – I didn't mean to skip ahead. No, no, anyway, no. It's okay. so, We've turned up to this event, and my coach Anthony Lange was also um, fighting in this event. So they had lightweight, middleweight, and heavyweight. So I just went in the heavyweight. Um, I probably could have made the middleweight um, division, but I'm like, eh, whatever. Um, I just jumped up to to the heavyweight. We kind of got there, and we saw this ring with chains, and we're like, what's going on? You know, this is this is a big drop in. Um, you know, what we expected. And I'm like, because I'm trying to remember, I think it was something like a, a pissy appearance fee and then the, the goal, you know, you're going to win big money. Um, and then I've just, me and my coach have just gone, you know, this is ridiculous, you know. We've turned up, it's, it's, it's in a basketball stadium with, you know, stadium seating and you've got this dodgy ring and then, he just kind of go, comes up and goes, look, look, you know, please fight. We need you. We need to make this event happen if you want to build the sport, blah, blah, blah. And I'm kind of like, oh, wow. And he, he goes, look, oh, I'll pay you up your purse. And I think he up from $200 appearance to $1,000. And I just went, Jesus. oh, what the hell? Why not? So I ended up jumping in and um, fighting in the event. And my first opponent was, um, he was about, I think. Kevin McConaughey. Kevin kind of around the 260, 265 pounds, I think around 120 kilos. Big guy. Um, but actually at one point during the match, I was still so angry at the promoter for this, this ring that I drove Kevin up against the chain, like the, the ropes. And instead of trying to take him down, I'm actually trying to push the posts over. <laughs> this is how... Was it just like, janky? I'm, I'm not even thinking at the time, like, I'm going to fall with this. Like, it didn't even... I was just so angry at, at, at the setup and everything that happened. I'm like, I'm just going to take the, cake, the, the ring down. And I'm driving up against it. And they literally had... They ended up getting all these security coming up and holding the corner posts and... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, ah, oh, okay, it's not going down. So then I turned him off the 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 uh, the chain, and then ended up mounting him, and uh, I, was, I was ground and pounding him, and he's grabbed both my hands, and he just pulled them apart, or he's just holding them there, and I'm trying. I'm like, I'm on mount, and he's stupidly strong, like you know, monster guy. You know, I'm probably 200 soaking wet at the time. And he's holding my hands. And I just had this thought go through my head. And I've just gone, this smile. And I've just spread my hands. 
and whack, come down the middle with this massive headbutt. Apparently, the sound reverberated <laughs> through the stadium. Um, and it's, as soon as that's happened, he's kind of let go of my hands and then I've just unloaded with the ground and a pound. Uh, honestly, I can't remember if I used punches and elbows or just punches or what, but um, the rep ended up jumping in <coughs> um, and stopping it. So, you know, successful. I kind of go into each round, get into the final. Well, what, the, final the final, you had Daniel Bond fights Neil Bodycoat, the guy that beat Elvis in a grappling tournament prior. A little yep. bit of rivalry there. Yep. Can't continue. So Daniel comes and fights you in the finals. So there's no alternate bouts in this in this. No, in this that's right, yes. Okay. Go so, ahead. I've got, and interestingly enough, Daniel is one of Chris Hazeman's students. So there was a little bit more. I'm like, okay, now I've got something to, to prove. And so the fight starts, we exchange. Uh, I'm not even sure how the takedown happens. We end up in a grappling exchange. I take his back, um, a la Murillo Bustamanche, and I'm hooks in and I'm just, unloading on the back of his head and he's like I'm even not even trying to break him down I think I was trying to choke him trying to break him down and you know uh wasn't working so I've just kind of sat back and then just started to unload and literally bouncing his face off the canvas and now I think I've, I've hit it the face bounce and then I've shot my hand in to get the rear naked and just as I've shot the rear, the hand in, and it was pretty deep, wasn't locked in, but it was kind of on the way there. The ref has jumped in and stopped the fight. And like, you know, I, I've jumped up. Well, what are you doing? And he goes, you've won. I'm like, I had to finish. I'm like, I wanted to choke him. <clears throat> and like, he gets up and he, Chris jumps in and we're all arguing about restarting the match. And then I went, ah, oh, bugger it, I've won. So I've just stepped off. I'm like, I'll let his coach argue for Daniel, you know. Um, I'm like, he wasn't going to get out of that. I would have liked to have got the, the definitive finish. But at this point, I've kind of realized, like, not my problem. And so now the crowd starts rioting. So the crowd is screaming, boo, boo, boo. <clears throat> they start throwing cans and cups and all sorts of stuff into the ring. It's 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 starting to turn into a serious riot. And I'm just standing there going, yeah, whatever. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this can going. <laughs> <laughs> Look like a full can just coming from my head. And I'm it's an expensive thing to throw. I might add. Can of you, beer. You, you gotta figure it, it probably costs them five bucks. Like it's <laughs> well, anyway. So, this, I don't know how I've done this. I've just gone and I've caught the can. <laughs> I've looked at the can, looked at the crowd, and then I've just gone and I've thrown it down and then thrown it into the crowd and then just stuck my hands up. The whole place went from rioting to cheering. <laughs> like, um, it was crazy and apparently there is footage out there no I've never seen it and I've never seen anyone who's seen it because again because Randy was bankrupt the video guys wouldn't give him the, the, the footage until he paid them that's so I don't know if he ended up getting the footage years later or if he never got the footage or if it's someone's vault somewhere. But I tried so hard to get this footage because all I wanted it to do was contact VB, which was the beer, beer company in Melbourne, Victoria Bitter, and go, guys, this ad is for you. And I'm like, I would have been sponsored. I would have been set for life. And sadly... Never end, ever got my hands on it, never saw the footage. And now it's just a story I'll be able to have to tell my children. No, I have to just believe me. 
So, so Randy Bell, do you run into him after this, or does he just well, disappear completely? He pretty much just disappeared. Um, I, I can't remember if I saw him once or twice afterwards, but he pretty much disappeared off the face of the earth. And I only found out um, a couple of years back that he was back in the US, some Midwest town, because uh, a reporter had kind of uh, got in touch with me um, doing, you know, basically a, a historical um, overview of, you know, MMA in Australia, or overall, you know, the history of MMA and stuff. And that's, that's how I found out he'd returned to the US. But yeah, no, I pretty much lost touch and uh, never saw him again. Hey, oh. I, I, gotta, I gotta ask you, in between there, you, that, that fight that you referred that Chris Hazeman helped you get in Japan, Yes. You weren't kid- you weren't kidding. They sent you in against the number one guy. If they sent you in with Tamura, yeah. that was their boy. That's correct. Yeah, he yeah. was their boy. Yeah. How um, did that, that feel? Was- how does he? How did he feel? Like how good or how protected was he in your opinion? Um, physically, I, I think I was a lot bigger than him. Okay. Um, he was jacked, obviously. Like he was in. They don't cut shape. weight. They don't cut weight um, in Japan. Yeah. So he was, he was, he was Jack, but he wasn't a big guy. I didn't, I didn't feel um, physically overwhelmed. He seemed, he seemed a lot, a lot like Frank. Yeah. Uh, very, ag- very agile. Um, moves very well. Had good technique. Um, was fast, but it didn't feel um, overly. Pa- I mean, obviously, it, it's open hand striking. It wasn't any punching, so. You know, it's hard to gauge just how good, um, how hard he might have been able to hit. And obviously, there's no ground and pound um, in mm-hmm. rings. But, you know, he was obviously, he, he was very skilled and um, very nimble. Um, and again, that was the match where I pulled off the first um, uh, go-go platter in MMA. Um, back then, I called it a shin choke. Um, and mm-hmm. it was, uh, the ref stopped it because I think we touched the ropes or something like he touched the ropes or I touched the ropes or something because they had rope escapes back then. So if you touch the ropes, they stopped. So I had him in a a Goga Plata, um, which was off a pail. Sorry? And use the rope escape. Yeah, yeah. And then... um, So so for those that own a rope escape, you get a reset. It's like a 10-8 round and people would use it to their advantage. And it was well, just did, always just like this gray area of getting out of a submission. It's really strange. It was like you had three lives. I think it was you got three rope escapes or something in a fight or something. Um, and to be fair, I um, ended up having to use uh, a rope escape because when we were scrambling, he was. I went for a leg lock and I went for a cross ankle lock, what's known as a shoelace lock. Um, and I had it locked in very tight. But... What I hadn't kind of considered, because I obviously I got caught up in the fight, is in rings you wear shin pads. And the, the, the cross ankle is your shin into the back of your Achilles and you really crank it. You can pop ankles and things like that. Extremely painful. And I locked it in and I was cranking away and it wasn't coming on. And it just didn't occur to me... Um, that were wearing shin pads, and that's what had saved him. And then I made the mistake of actually um, sticking my leg across, and he actually ended up catching a heel hook <laughs> on my uh, leg um, because I had I had everything proper. The leg was safe, but then I'm trying to crank, and then I've just kind of forgotten about my other leg. And then he's gone for the heel hook, and I've actually rope escaped. But he cranked it on, so I ended up popping. Um, a tendon, uh, uh, I think it was like my LCL or something like that. Um, and so during the fight, I started off as orthodox and I ended up switching to southpaw. And that's because I, I'd popped the, the, the LCL. Like it wasn't a full tear, but it was bad enough that I couldn't move properly on it. And so for the rest of the fight until... Basically, I, I kind of ran, started to run out of steam. It was a 30-minute match, um, and it was a fairly short-notice fight. Um, and at, at the 10-minute mark, I kind of started running out of gas. 
in one of the scrambles, he got on side control and did a, a prone arm bar. And I, I kind of quick tapped. Uh, I, I realized I could have escaped them. But, uh, you know, he got That's it, whatever. Game. That's the game. Um, yeah. But interestingly enough, the only footage Frank got of me before I fought Frank Shamrock um, in the K1 was that fight. So he went in thinking I was Southpaw. And so when I uh, started fighting him orthodox, I actually caught him off guard. So there you go. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. So, so one of the, Miguel and I, we do a bunch of different, we do like a deep dive history, which is what this is. But we also yeah. do an ADCC history show that we release once a week. And you were at the inaugural ADCC on March 20th, 1998 in Abu Dhabi. That's correct. Yes. How do you get the invite do you bring a corner or do you have a roommate? Uh, no, I didn't bring a corner. I just, I, um, i trying to remember. I, I, I basically like, I, you know, every, you remember adcombat.com. There was the yeah. news site back at the time. It's where everyone uh, kind of went to for their MMA and grappling news. And they'd announced the events and <clears throat> they were talking about they'd invited a lot of big names and they were getting turned down. And I just went, can't hurt to, to contact them. And so I, I shot them an email and said, look, you know, I'm keen to, um, to come over and, you know, I'd love to compete in this uh, event. Um, so they're like, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, they, I didn't get the option of bringing a corner. It was like, we can only fly you over because, again, from Australia, it's a lot more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like, yeah, sweet, no problems. Um, and ended up heading over there. And I have to say, it was one of the most uh, awesome experiences and memories I've uh, got under my belt. So, okay, you, do you have a roommate when you're there? Um, yeah, I think it was, um, I can't remember who my roommate was, but there was, um, I got on, ended up hanging out with Jason Fan and Charles, um, Charles is nice. McCarthy. No, 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 no. It wasn't Charles McCarthy. It was, uh, he wasn't even a fighter. He actually came, I think he came across with uh, Jason. Um, so I just ended up making friends with them. Like I ended up hanging out with them a lot. And um, we ended up coming up with a, a team Klinko um, hand sign just because it was just this one, one day really weird. We had these people following us obviously a clean cleaning company and they were just following us around and it was just like you really dirty <laughs> i don't know if it was coincidence or what or if we were just and then it kind of and then we on on the um the tv there they had a lot of um indian and pakistani music so like all the channels were like music channels and one of the songs was this hand what and so we kind of stole that and came up with team Klinko and then jason ended up uh, uh george charleswood um ended up making t-shirts and mailing it out to me afterwards and stuff um but yeah it was um we're in a hotel and it was very interesting is obviously there are a lot of rules about when you could go out where you could go out what you could wear and and um things like that so yeah it was definitely uh, interesting uh, experience. Okay. Now, your Sperry, first match. But, but Sperry ran the table over there. He was the big star that came out of that. And uh, yes. you already knew him before that. Was he accessible? Did he ignore you? Or did he remember you? Maybe even yeah, put no, his no. word for you. Well, okay. So I'll, I'll take a step back. So as you know, I, I met Mario at the, um, the Cage Combat Australasian UFC and you know, I introduced myself after, I'd introduced myself beforehand anyway. And I said, look, you know, regardless of whether we fight or not, I just want to let you know, I have a great deal of respect for you. You know, I trained jujitsu. I was a green belt, which was like a four stripe white belt at the time. And here's this black belt and I'm planning to, to step in with him. Um, but I just wanted to let him know there was no disrespect. I'm just doing it because it's yeah. tournament. He's like, he's like, yeah, no, cool. And then after the event, he actually ended up running um, a seminar in the, the city of Sydney. So jiu-jitsu seminar. So I turned up and I, I went to pay for my seminar. He's like, no, no, you can, you can do it for free. And I'm like, oh, okay, thank you very oh, wow. much. 
Um, but interestingly enough, is well, he just won twenty five grand too. Let's, yeah. Let's... <laughs> yeah, but I, I know a lot. A lot of um, I won't go. To, it doesn't matter how much they won; they still want more. But he was right. very good anyway. D Dan Severin <laughs> wouldn't give away a free gem in our mic. No way. <laughs> no, no, no! It wasn't free for everyone. It's just he just let me. Jump no, no, in. no! I understand. Yeah, no, that, not not one. Dan Severin wouldn't give one away. Not one. Yeah. No. But anyway, um, go ahead. But anyway, during the seminar, so he was still learning English, and one of the things he kept getting confused about was the word hip and rip. Move your rip, and then we're like, your rib. This is your ribs up here, and he goes, oh, this one, this one. We go, your hip, and so he kept during the seminar kept kept saying rib we kept saying no hip hip uh there was a few other things he made mistakes with but the reason i remember that is when he released his instructionals he go he would always say move your rib move your rib and i'm like the rest of the world has no idea what's going on but i know to move my hip now <laughs> that's awesome but anyway that's so awesome. then, yeah, then we got back to um abu dhabi i ended up meeting him over there yeah he was really cool um you know, he chatted to me and stuff. I didn't get to train with him or anything, but he was definitely, you know, very cool. He remembered me. Um, I actually, years later, ended up going back, uh, going to Brazil to compete at the Mundials, um, went down to BTT and train with them. Uh, he remembered me, introduced me to Murillo and um, Paulo and, you know, all those guys, Carlos Bajeto, uh, everyone back then. So, yeah, no, he was very cool. And as you said, the ADCC was pretty cool. You know, some big names. John Lewis was there. Um, Oleg Taktarov, um, Rico Rodriguez. And obviously, um, the, the big name was uh, Mario Sperry. Big Al. There's your old <laughs> now, there was, there's there's Oleg, Oleg uh, had a rough Abu Dhabi that year. And there are yes. rumors that, that he was... Uh, Partying pretty heavily is uh, are you were, did you bear witness to anything of that nature or what can you tell I, us? I didn't see any of the partying, but um, I remember one day, and I feel bad about telling the story, but I don't know Oleg, so I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> um, Oleg came in and he was um, a little bit under the weather, so maybe the partying stuff was, was true, and um, he goes outside. And he goes, comes back in and he's all wet. And everyone, he's like, everyone's like, where have you been? He goes, oh, I went swimming in the pool outside. You should go, come, come, come check out the pool, come swimming. Um, and so ADCC was in an equestrian center. So what the pool was, is it was just one of those walk pits that they walk, they walk horses through for rehab. And so everyone's just going, you know, it's for horses. They walk horses through. And you go, you go, you know what happens when a horse walks in water, right? Same thing a dog does. It's going to start pissing. He goes, that's literally just piss and water. You've just been swimming in piss and water. And so they started giving him shit for a while. <laughs> oh, man. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm sure they chlorinated it and stuff like that. I'm like, but it was just funny that they were giving him shit for swimming in the, um, the horse pool. Miguel, who did we have on that said Oleg was on a boat? It may have been him. Then he was doing like cocaine. He was just doing cocaine the entire time and then fit the grappling tournament in. Was that Oleg that told us that in his interview? No, I'm drawing a blank who it was that said it. But yeah, they painted Oleg as parting is pretty hard over there. Well, I, remember uh, Dennis going the boat. I remember going out in a boat and partying, but I for some reason, I thought that was after the event, not not before, but I could be wrong. But, yeah. um, Oleg was doing it before. I think it may have been Dennis Hallman, Miguel. Could be. Could be. Okay. Yeah, they were saying he was doing coke the entire time and somehow fit the tournament in. So you had mentioned earlier, uh, you get the first heel hook in ADCC history. Clarence Thatch is your Thatch. opponent. Were that you real loose a going into this, or were you one of those guys, first person, like, at the rules meeting? Um, oh, I was probably first person at the rules meet just because I wanted to meet everyone. Like, I'll be honest, like, you know, even when I was fighting, I, I was a big fan. Like, I was, I was just like the fan who got the opportunity to meet 
my grappling and fighting idols and then I got to also compete as well so you know I, I, I was always first at these events just because I wanted to kind of meet everyone and introduce myself and um, I got photos with them but obviously sadly nothing digital so I'm not sure what happened to a lot of the stuff I think you know I've moved a couple of times over the years so photos have slowly kind of been misplaced I'm sure I've got them somewhere um, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, and then your second opponent is Hinato Verissimo. So, you know, you went one and one. You know, it's a respectable showing and um, fantastic experience, especially being involved in the inaugural one. I mean, I know you're always known for being the first Australian in your country to fight for a world title, but that initial 1998 ADCC invite holds some, some pretty big weight as well, in my opinion. Yeah, no, look, I, I definitely hold that um, just as high as uh, any of my MMA um, invitations and stuff like that. Um, as I said, got to meet some great names and um, it was an awesome opportunity. And I, again, it's kind of interesting how a lot of the contacts kind of um, connected through because um, I think Mark Robinson, uh, the South African um, sumo guy wrestler was... A, was at, at that event I met him and one of his students ended up training with me years later um, I know Hanato Verissimo was um, BJ Penn's uh, jiu-jitsu coach for a while yes. ended up meeting BJ and becoming good friends with BJ Penn um, so it's kind of it is it's pretty cool how and, uh, and uh, Rika was also um, a Hegan Machado um, I can't remember if he was a black belt at the time, but I remember he was a Higgin Machado student. I, you know, met Rico there and ended up meeting him years later, also through the UFC and um, through Higgin and that sort of stuff. So it's kind of pretty cool, like how small the community was back then, like both in MMA and the, the submission grappling and how many connections kind of, kind of crossed over. As I said, you know, um, Frank was in the corner of Matt Rock, and I, I would end up fighting Frank. Um, two fights the, from now. Two and, fights from now, actually. We're yeah. getting there. We're getting there. Hey, dude, we got and you, buddy. He, he ended up actually, um, I think, commentating for my fight against Jeremy Horn as well. So it's just amazing how things are just so connected back then. You know what's crazy as well? Like you and you said Chris Heisman. And Chris is an Australian pioneer. Like he was legitimately like the first person from your country that really planted the Australian flag. You know, going over to Japan, you know, in 97, he, like you said, he had about a half dozen fights underneath his belt, which is pretty incredible. I think, no the, the, other person, I think the other person around the same time was Larry Papadopoulos. So uh, yes. Chris was going over to rings. Larry was going over to shooter. So, uh, you know, it's always good to give both guys their recognition. And my, uh, my coach, Anthony Lange, actually ended up uh, fighting in Shudo as well a couple of times. Yeah. How was Chris I, I, uh, as a promoter? I was just going to mention Chris and, and Larry Papadopoulos also uh, got to go to Abu Dhabi, but you did, you did beat them there. They, they went in, yeah. in subsequent years. Yeah, that's correct. How was Chris as a promoter? <clears throat> because you fought for him on September 13th, 1998. Al Reynoso was your opponent. Yes, that, that's, um, that's a very interesting event. Um, like <laughs> Tell us. Um, it's almost like quite, we knew the answer to this, Miguel, before we asked it. So go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he got me up and, you know, I'm like, you know, want to fight in the event? No problem. My guy. And I'm like, yeah, sure. No problem. Um, obviously, it didn't occur to me that... Um, obviously with him promoting and then him being in charge of the referee. And apparently the referee was also one of his students and training partners of Al. Um, Who was training under Chris. Chris at yeah. the time. So yeah. you know, I, I took the fight and got in there. You know, he was a tough kid. Um, and I ended up, I'm not even sure how it happened, taking him down. I think I ended up mounted him. Um, I ended up arm barring him. And then the armbar ended up going belly down. And, you know, 
I'm not a dick, and I, I had it on tight, and um, he he was he tapped, and um, now what was also happening was one of the security guards was banging on, and again one of his security guards, who also trained with Al and Chris, um, was banging on the the ring, you know, yelling at. Um, Al to, 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 you know, to get out or whatever or whatever. And I, and I armbarred him and I cranked it. I felt the tap on my leg. And I, obviously I didn't wait for the ref to stop the match. I've stopped the match. I've stood up. Al's got up like this, head down. He knew. He knew he'd lost. Um, and then the ref goes. And I just turned to the ref. I go, he tapped. And Al's like this head down and instead of turning to Al and go did you tap he goes I didn't see a tap continue did, did like, your corner say anything at this point I think they were shouting from the corner he tapped he tapped and and then they're like oh no, no there's no tap that was the um security there was someone banging on the ring it wasn't a tap and I'm like that's not what I was referring to like I because I was belly down, he was here, you know, tapped on my leg. I felt it. I didn't hear the tap. A tap on your leg is going to be a lot different than a, a pounding on the cage or, or the, yeah, the, the floor. Well, the, the, it was actually a ring. A ring, yeah, and, yeah. And also, everyone was screaming because he was the hometown boy. So I wouldn't have heard a tap anyway, but I felt it. And then they're like, well, continue. I'm like, Fuck it, all right, whatever. And so the fight continued. I think uh, I can't even remember. Again, striking. Um, you know, I think I, at, at this point I got busted up. I walked into something. I was bleeding, but whatever. It doesn't bother me. Uh, and then I, I think of how I got there. I got into a heel hook. Now, um, I had the heel hook deep, and I'm trying to roll him into the cage, and he's holding on to the ring and he's literally like falling out of the ring because he's pulling himself out like and I'm pulling him in and I kind of yank yank and then he kind of comes into the cage and just as he falls the referee steps in and breaks it up I'm like what are you doing and he goes oh he was falling out of the cage I'm like well he's in now and I've got the heel hook um and he's like, no, no, break, separate, stand up. And at this point, I'm like. You can only fight so many people, you know? I'm like, I'm not supposed to win this. And I just walked to my corner. I just went, this is bullshit, throwing the towel. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not doing this anymore. It's like, you know, I'm not fighting the ref and, and Al. So he ended up, they just threw the towel in. We went, whatever. And yeah, that's history. It's crazy based on that experience. That, 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 that that's a, another that's a loss of my record now. So yeah. yeah, it's crazy. You based on that experience and the experience where you were trying to uh take the ring post down, feel free, feel comfortable knowing that stuff like that happened in Iowa all the time. You know what I mean? So so you're yeah, really no, no. paying your dues. I, I remember the uh the old hook and shoot days, so I used to, <laughs> to follow that as well. Yes, thank yeah. you, sir. <laughs> So did Chris call you afterward or was, was it just, it is what it is? Pretty much just, it, it is what it is. And it just kind of left it at that. Funnily enough though, um, obviously we were supposed to fight uh, UFC 110, but my shoulder um, got jacked. And I, so I ended up having to, to pull out of that fight. So that didn't happen. He actually got offered the, um, the, the Crow Cop fight, he actually turned it down. He goes, no, I'm just happy to take my purse. Um, probably a smart decision. I'm guessing he didn't want... I think he was looking for a retirement fight. He wasn't looking to fight anymore um, because obviously if he'd taken the Crow Cop fight, they would have kept him um, in the UFC. Um, so he, he turned that down. But then a couple of years later after that, he actually through someone else got in touch with me, they were looking at starting uh, an MMA TV show. And he, he obviously knew I was the most 
uh, well-spoken and obviously one of the pioneers of the sport. And he actually wanted to get me into, um, as one of the, the, the co-commentators, he was going to be the head guy and I was going to be working with him and another guy. So, you know, I, I kind of got on board, um, was ready to sign contracts, but then their sponsors or something, I don't know whether the sponsors fell through or maybe the, um, the contract with the TV station ended up falling through. And then obviously a couple of years later, I got the, the Fox Sports um, gig. Right. Well, either way, he was thinking of you. You know, that, that's, that's really all you could really ask yeah. for. So you flew out to Canada June 2nd, 2000. Your original opponent was supposed to be Chemo, I believe. Chemo Leopoldo, that's correct. And then you ended up fighting Dave Benito. Yes. Well, How much again, did you... Pardon me? Okay. This is a really interesting story, so... Wait, 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 wait one second. Stuff. Miguel, okay. in our pre-prep, Miguel, you were like, yeah, you know, he's got you know, about 20 fights, and you know, we, we usually interview people with, with you know, 40, 50 fights. And I said, Miguel, every single fight of his is... There's, like, lunacy. Like, he... he it's like the fight game was trying to take your sanity away from you and you kept going back to it. So, so go ahead, <laughs> explain what happens. Well, also caveat the first, the you know, he in the first Australian MMA event, there was Elvis. The first Abu Dhabi, there was Elvis. And this is the first UCC, you know. It is the first UCC. A, a very historic Can Canadian event, so. So the UCC, I'm sure as most of you, um, viewers would be aware, eventually became TKO, which is the organization yes. BSP uh, ended up coming out of. So I met uh, Joe Silver and Pete Rodley, who was, I think, uh, one of the promoters or organizers of the UCC on what was called the combat mailing list. So before the website, uh, the internet became as what it is today, it was like a mailing list where you would mail in and talk email in and talk to people in a group kind of setting. So I'd met Pete um, in this mailing list, as I said, along with uh, Joe Silva. And he was, he's like, oh, look, um, we're looking at running an event um, in Canada, UCC, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, look, I'm, I'm keen to, to jump in. I want to fight at light heavyweight. They're like, look, we've got enough light heavyweights. Would you be interested in fighting heavyweight? And I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> I haven't fought for a couple of years. I'll, I'll jump in with um, whatever I can. Um, now, I was supposed to fight in their second event, not the first one. Okay. So the first event was um, they had um, a heavyweight title fight with Chemo versus I can't remember Stefan's name. Um, he's a French guy. Anyway, okay. he ended up having a, a, a car accident and have, get breaking his neck and getting fused discs or something Jesus. like that. Yeah, strange. He still ended up fighting years later anyway. But anyway, so I was supposed to fight in the second event where they were going to have a heavyweight tournament and the winner would fight the winner of this event. So they would have an inaugural title, heavyweight tournament, and then the winner would fight that further down and then about two weeks before the event uh, Pete's gotten in touch with me and he's gone look um, we've lost um, our main event would you be interested in stepping in against chemo I'm like yeah sure whatever so I've jumped in um, flown over and now on the plane on the way over apparently chemo has pulled out so I've hit the country uh, in and go, the new opponent. You land with a new opponent. <laughs> well, no, they go, we haven't got you an opponent. Like, we, um, Chemo was supposed to land before you. You know, he, was, he left, was meant to have left around the same time. But obviously, my flight was 20-something hours, um, you know, with the stopovers and stuff. And obviously, I didn't have the ability to, to get in touch with anyone during a flight leg. Um, so I didn't find anything out. But apparently, um, he never got on his flight. They tried contacting him. They couldn't get in touch with him. And then on AD Combat um, news site, there's a photo of him with his finger in a splint holding up an x-ray. 
And so apparently Pete contacted and said, look, I know you, um, you're injured or whatever's going on. Just jump on a plane, come over here, talk to the crowd, tell them, explain what happened, tell them you'll fight, <coughs> you know, for the title at the next event. Um, and apparently he, he didn't even turn up for that. Like, I think he agreed to do it, but then never got on the plane. So they've come to me and they go, look. Yeah, he was lying. He was I, lying the whole way through. <laughs> yeah. So they've, um, they've, they've gone, look, we've got a um, short notice. Got to get you an opponent. And they've come up and they go, look, we've got um, Tom Erickson. And I'm like, look, I'll be honest. I will fight Tom. I'm not going to do it on two days notice. I'm like, the guy is well over 300 pounds. He's a monster. <clears throat> He's the sort of guy I need to prepare for properly. Yeah, you know, these guys for sure. Like, you know, I, I'm coming in expecting to fight Kima. I'm happy to, to stand up and bang and I feel my jiu-jitsu can match it. That's, that's, but, you know, a 300 plus pound wrestler. High-end wrestler, <laughs> Olympic <laughs> alternate. Yeah, yeah, I mean, no. And so they went, all right, let's see who else we can find. They go, how about Dan Severn? And I go, look, Dan Severn is a little bit smaller, but not a lot. He's basically the same guy. He's a high-level wrestler. He's an absolute monster. I go, look, I understand the predicament you're in. Why don't you put Dan and um, how those two together? Yeah. I go, you've got, you've got two, two, super, two super heavyweight um, wrestlers. I think that would be a fantastic match. Just throw me in the undercard. I'm sure you can find someone. They're like, no, 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 no. And I'm assuming it's probably financial as well. Because <coughs> um, it would have cost them a lot more to get um, Tom and Dan in to fight each other on short notice. So they've gone up and goes, how about Jeremy Horn? And I'm like, yep, oh, I'll take that fight. Um, and so they contacted Jeremy. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh. Uh, no, I don't think so. And so he ended up, I think he initially kind of uh, accepted, but then when they couldn't find any information on me, I think he um, ended up not taking the fight. And then they Jeremy up, doesn't turn down many fights. I mean, he's no, that, 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 that's surprising. Look, it, um, again, mate, it, it could have been it's not enough time to get up there. It could have been. Who knows? I, I, I have no idea. Um, I'm, I know what Jeremy's like, so I'm not going to allude yeah, to the fact he's a for sure. or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. He, he, yeah sure. he just, for, for whatever reason, it's just interesting that they offered it to me and that I would actually end up fighting him at a later date. Um, so I didn't get that fight. And then they come up with uh, Dave Benito. And I'm like, God, isn't Dave the same size as Dan Severn? Like, he's another, you know, I know he's Canadian, but isn't he kind of like another wrestler, grappler? <clears throat> You know, he's a super heavyweight. And I'm like, they're like, no, 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 no. He's not as big anymore. He's about 230, 240. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, oh, well, that's fair enough. That's here's the caveat. He, he's got wins over Todd Medina and Carlos Pajeto, who's one of the top three in the world. Yes. At, at one point in his career. So he's... Benito's a savage. He's legit. I, I knew who he was. Like I, yeah, and he was, was 240 because he got him. in shape. You know, he was 240 because he got himself in shape. He was taking it seriously. Well, no. Well, they told me he was that around 230. They said 230 to 240. So I'm like, okay, you know, chemo was meant to be about 230, whatever. Uh, not a bit. Like, you know, 10, 15 pounds, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fuss. So we go to it's on weigh-in day. And I've got to be I'm trying to remember. I had to be 210 or two. I think I had to be over 210 or over 215. I can't remember. But I definitely wasn't. <laughs> so I'm like, so I don't want to pay in. So I didn't know what, obviously, there were no real athletic commissions. But so I ended up putting ankle weights on so that I would weigh in um, at exactly, I think, about 215. But I'm not even close. I was about 205 or something. So I ended up putting these ankle weights on and I had tracksuit pants on and I ended up going in and, and weighing in and jumping on 215. I'm like, oh, fantastic. And then Dave turns up, jumps on the scale, keeps his T-shirt on, 265. 
And I've gone to the guys. I'm like, he told me it was like 2.30, maybe 2.40. And they go, oh, <laughs> he told us it was about 2.45. So we thought, you know, we just massage a number to, to encourage you to take the fight. And I'm like, one, I would have taken 2.45 anyway. It's close enough. <clears throat> um, but then again, I guess if he'd said 2.65, I might have hesitated. And I just went, fuck it. I'm in here. I'm doing it anyway. So I ended up uh, taking the fight, jumping in. It was two 10-minute rounds. And um, this one ends up going down as a draw. Um, Miguel, Miguel, this guy flies from Australia, has a different opponent, totally hometown. I mean, when you're coming in, main event two? Yep, main event. Yeah, this is a main event. Title. And he gets a draw. In other words, hey, oh, guys. I don't know. Let, me tell, let me tell you the story. Go ahead. So, basically, <laughs> we go in. Trade, first round, I'm just leg kicking um, Benito, like chopping hard. And he's like, he doesn't like them. I'm not, I'm not getting into boxing range because I'm like, I'm not two, 265. I'm not going to get hit with that. <laughs> and, you know, I wasn't even 215. So I'm chopping away. He ends up taking me down first round. And I've locked up my grips. And he's postured up to punch me. And I've just gone, boom, straight into an armbar. Um, he's gone, shit, drop down, and I've locked in a triangle. And he's gone, oh, posh it up, escaped out, and then just gone, shit, and just stuck his head in my chest and just basically rabbit punch until the ref stood him up. I kick him again, he'd shoot, head in chest, and just, he wouldn't, after that first exchange where I almost sub submitted him, he wouldn't posture up anymore. So <clears throat> it goes this way for most of the round. And then we're at the, you know, we're back we're again, back on our feet. We kept getting stood up because he wasn't doing any action on the ground. Uh, we kept getting stood up and then we're kind of grappling and we hit the ropes. And instead of pulling guard, I've dropped down. I picked up a single and I've caught him off guard and I've taken him down. Wow. I'm like, yes, now that's it. I've jumped on top and I've, Kind of, I'm in half guard. And I'm like, I'm not even going to try and pass. I've just come through with his elbow. And I think it landed. Nothing too much. Like it wasn't super flush, but it landed pretty good. And the bell is gone. I'm like, no, ah, damn it. So then, yeah, nine minutes, of, nine minutes and fifty seconds worth of work wasted. Right? Yeah, but I'm like, you know what? It's good. I, I'm feeling good. Okay. Like, um, I was a little bit terrified when I first hit the country because I'd never flown that far to fight sort of thing um, on short notice. And I literally, <laughs> when I'd gotten in the country like two days before my fight, I had no cardio. Like I didn't know what happened. I was like, I couldn't, do, I could not do one minute rounds on the pad. I just, I was like, but I think it was just jet lag. I think I, I just didn't. And I actually I surprisingly recovered pretty quickly within the two days because I felt great. I'd gone the first round, <clears throat> went hard, felt confident, went into the second round. And again, my strategy was to, to chop his leg. I just kept chopping his legs. He kept taking me down. And then I do it and we get stood up, we get taken down. I think it was about three or four minutes into the round. And now I'm ready for it. I know what he's going for. So he goes for his shot and I pull guard, foot in the hip, sit back, underhook his arm, pull it in, and I have a prone arm bar. So I pop my foot in, other foot of hip on the shoulder. I've got his arm extended, his hand on my shoulder, and I've got the prone arm bar and I'm cranking it. But I'm not a dick. And he goes, stop, stop, stop. So he doesn't actually physically tap. He just yells, stop. And I'm holding it and I'm going, rep. He's tapping, he's tapping. And he looks at the ref. Um, <clears throat> I have a funny feeling it was Mario Yamasaki, but I could be wrong. And he goes, oh, my knee, my knee. And so he goes, stop, stop, stop. They separate it. I start cheering. I, I've won. My coach goes, no, no, no. Until your hand is raised, sit down. Don't waste your energy. I'm like, 
I'm like, I had him in a submission. The match has stopped. It, I've won. He's like, sit down. And I'm like, all right. So I sit down, cross my legs. <clears throat> and they spend five minutes. They get the doctor in. They put his knee. I don't know. Oh, my God. Knee, I don't know. I, I think it might have been his kneecap, not actually his knee. But he was saying my knee. But I, I'm guessing his. Because as I said, I was kicking the shit out of his leg. And so the ref goes, after five minutes, he goes, do you need more time to rest? And he goes, and I'm, and I'm like, what do you mean more time? He goes, oh, yeah, I could use a bit more time. And then this, the ref goes, if you need more time, we're going to have to stop the fight. And then he goes, all right, I'll continue. And I've gone, what the fuck? And like, so I'm like, I'm like, ref, he, he tapped, he, he gave up. The ref's like, no, nope. continue. And I must have had this angry look because i've just gone at him and i was just going to kick that leg it's almost, as hard as i could yeah it's, 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 ah. and he's literally turned around and kind of run to avoid me and i started and then he's turned around and shot and then put me on my back and then basically just um <coughs> held me there um and i I think this may have been in this round. One of the, I can't remember if it was the first or the second round. At one point, I'd elbowed from underneath and I'd actually opened him up over his eyebrow. And what he ended up doing, which I thought was very clever, was he stuck his head right in my chest and he used the pressure from driving his head in my chest to actually stop the bleeding, close the cut. Uh, it, it wasn't that big, but it was uh, kind of interesting. So then... Basically, the rest of the fight goes like that. They don't stand him up again. He just sits in my guard, just rabbit punching. We get stood up. I'm like, there's no way I can lose this fight. And then they well, go can, I interject? The can I interject? So when the judges' scorecards come out, you know, they have like 10, 9 must rounds and they deduct fouls. But they also probably had like a little side portion for how much your airfare would have costed had that belt left with you. Yeah, probably. I, as I said, the, like I spoke to some of the the judges, and they said, based on the criteria we were given, we couldn't give you the win because I don't think submission attempts or I don't know <clears throat> were listed on there or something like that. So I don't know. I ended up getting a draw, but the, the funny thing is, is we got this photo with me, and I'm like all the ring girls lined up, arms around them. I've got this big grin on my face, like, and he's just standing there, like, despondent after yeah. the match. And I'm like, well, even though I didn't get the belt, we know who won. And and sadly, the footage then never eventuated again. So, again, it's just another one of those um, results of my record that doesn't really reflect um, what happened. How was Stephen Patry as a promoter? Yeah, he was, he was, as I said, they were fine. They treated me good. Um, again, it was still early days. I hadn't had a lot of experience with promoters. You know, as I said, they pretty much looked after me. They gave me, you know, flew me and my coach over, gave me a hotel room, per diem for food. I have nothing to complain about from, I mean, other than the, the actual result. Um, the rest of it was actually fine. I didn't have any issues. Did, uh, do you remember the Australian promotion Dojo KO? Yes, I, I barely, yes. I kind of remember it was around for a little while um, where they tried to <clears throat> merge like boxing and um, MMA and things like that. And I'm like, yeah, this is not going to last very long. They had everybody like on grappling mats, except elevated like a sumo. Yes. No ground MMA gloves. It was just a recipe for disaster. Well, it, it, I think it was the, the recipe for um, John Wayne Parr's cage Muay Thai later on. He just was smart enough to put it in the cage. <laughs> but yeah, having it on a platform wasn't a clever idea. Um, basically, I... Yeah, it was meant to be MMA boxing because, again, it was, I think it was supposed to be like 
bare knuckle boxing, but they couldn't get away with running a bare knuckle event in Australia. And that was probably the closest they were going to get to it. Okay. So we've had a couple people on from Australia and Sorry to Hector Lombard, Hector Lombard being one of them. And, and let me tell you some, one of our largest cities of listeners is actually from Sydney and Queensland. They kind of go back and forth. So we, we've got quite a few people that listen to our program from there, but Hector Lombard in Australia, do you think he may have worn out his welcome or do you think that maybe he was the constant victim of people being jealous? I, I, I trained with um, Hector for uh, a, a couple of times and obviously met him at events. I think I ended up rep, I rep one of his events, uh, one of his matches. I can't remember. He's a very intense individual and I'll kind of leave it at that. He's very intense. It is, um, and that pretty much explains a lot of stuff. Yeah, he, um, when we talked about Australia, like our, our entire interview with him, it was like a therapy session. Like it was, it, it, it hurt his feelings that he wasn't loved by your country. I'm surprised. Most people like, like, other than him being very intense and angry at times, um, I think a lot of people enjoyed watching him fight. So he wasn't, not like he wasn't popular or anything. People definitely enjoyed it. But I, I just think he was, <laughs> he didn't know how to tone down, like how he was in the cage is almost how he was outside. And as I said, I got on with him fine. I didn't have any issues with him. I trained with him. Um, I do have an interesting story with him. Um, he ended up breaking uh, my brother's ankle. Um, because we were, we were training. So just doing grappling and stuff. And um, my old business partner had a bad habit of like when rounds end yelling, keep going. Because I think he was wrestling Hector and he had Hector's back. And the buzzer goes for the five minutes and he goes, keep going. So he, could, he wanted to try and get the finish or whatever. And then, <clears throat> so Hector was wrestling my brother, grappling with my brother. Um, you know, obviously Hector's better, but my brother was still a very skilled grappler. Um, can't remember if my brother was a black belt at the time, may have been brown or something. Um, and so he's underneath Hector and he manages to get back to his feet just as the buzzer goes. So he relaxes. And then my business partner goes, keep going. So Hector has shot a, a power double. And so my brother has gone to, to brace and sprawl and his foot got stuck in the mat. And uh. Hector drove so hard that it actually snapped his ankle and um, leg. Like, yeah. Again, I, I don't blame Hector in it. It was because... No, it's not this what it is. Gone, but... It's just an interesting story. It just shows how intense he can be. It's just, he's an intense individual. And I think some people just couldn't handle it. As I said, I never had, I understood where he was coming from. I mean, you know, he's, he was a judo Olympian and, um, you know, MMA fighter. He was very, as I said, he didn't get to where he was um, by being mellow. <laughs> he just didn't know how to bring it down in general. So, a lot of people kind of took him the wrong way. Well, in our interview with him, we went like this. We go a little bit of fight by fight and kind of pepper in some questions. And I always mentioned whenever he was with a new team and how come you're with this team rather than saying, well, you know, I murdered a bunch of training partners at the old gym and they asked me to leave. He was just, it wasn't fair. <laughs> it was just... It's, yeah, he, he, probably, he probably went through quite a few tracks. Oh, my God. Uh, they, 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 probably didn't even, they probably didn't even ask him to leave. They just probably didn't want to train with him anymore. No, no. Can you blame him? And, you know, the rumor that I got, because hey, we, we do a lot of research here before we, we get to our guests, the rumor yeah. we got was that like somebody in the MMA scene broke into his house and ended up shooting his dogs just to kind of, like, show an example and, you know, we kind of talked about it a little bit, and he's just like, you know. 
Interesting. Interesting guy. But we're on a K1 Grand Prix. You're in Japan, December 10, 2000. Frank Shamrock well, is on a nine yep. fight win streak, just beat Tito Ortiz, and is considered the number one 205 pounder in the entire world. That's correct. Yep. Um, and now he was, so um, Javier Mendez, I believe, was uh, um, managing and obviously training him as well. Yeah. Uh, he, con he contacted me. You know, a couple of months before the K1 fight, and said, "If we offered you a fight with Frank Shamrock, would you take it?" I went, "Yeah, sure, absolutely." He goes, "All right, look, we're um, we're just looking at options at the moment, like nothing definitive. Just we just wanted to see where you're at." And I'm like, "Yeah, cool, no problem." And then didn't hear anything from them um, other than reading like you know the stuff on AD AD Combat. Um, they were looking; they were trying to get either Tamora. Um, I can't remember one of the Pancras guys uh, not Minowa one of the top Pancras guys I was trying to get one of the, the big names from either Pancras or Rings um, to fight Frank in the K1 in an MMA match and like apparently they were having success but I, I think some of these organisations probably just let it on because they weren't going to let their star obviously go to K1 and and fight. Um, so about, again, 10 days, two weeks before uh, the fight, I got a phone call from Harvey. He's going, look, um, we had a fight lined up. Um, it's fallen through. Are you available? I'm like, sure, I'll fight. No problem. Sounds like, sounds like fun. So I've, I've flown over to um, Japan on short notice get over there. Now I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. And I'm like, I see Frank. I'm like, oh, hey, Frank. Hey, how you going? And he's just like, uh. and I spoke to him afterwards and he had, he gets into this mindset. He, he can't be nice to, he's not the only one. I've had that with a lot of guys similar to, I think Bisping was very much the same. And, <clears throat> but he had, he's just like, no, just stay away. Oh, okay. Um, so obviously, you know, I'm there for the, the week and it was just awesome experience. Like I'm at the K1 Grand Prix and I'm meeting guys like uh, Hoost and Krokop and Stefan Lico and um, and then I'm out the back and I just keep running out the front, checking out. Like I got to meet um, um, Hicks and Gracie, Wallad Ishmael and I'm just meeting all these celebrities. I'm like, oh my God, it's my mind. It's oh, and I'm like, this is and uh, I think at, at one point, um, I'm trying to think who it was. Oh, Hickson, he's gone. What are you doing out here? I'm like, aren't you fighting tonight? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fighting Frank in the co-main event. And he's like, you should be resting. I'm like, oh, I know, but this is <laughs> such a great experience. Look, it's like 80,000 people in here and all these. And he's like, you know, you need to go back and rest. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. And um, so, but I still couldn't. I just like went out, would come out and watch, go back, come out and watch. Um, I also met Ray Seppo there as well. Yeah. Um, it was, I mean, it was the golden era of K1. Like these guys were awesome. Um, and then obviously my fight finally gets called up and um, I jump into. What was the purse like for this? So, I got five thousand dollars. Now I heard that I'm not. I don't know how true it is, but I heard Frank was given fifty thousand dollars, and it was up to him to work out the purses. Okay. So, I'm <laughs> assuming, so I'm assuming he was trying. Obviously, had more money to try and get a big name, and then when he didn't get a big name, um, obviously. You know, they offered me $5,000. i am like, yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, I probably... Short sure notice, like two weeks notice. Two weeks notice, yeah, too, two correct? Notice. But I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'll, I'll do it. The cabin, to put a little history behind it, yeah, you, you said uh, that Frank had just come off the Tito fight, but he took over a year off, and he hadn't been fighting. Yeah. And, you know... $50,000, you know, may not have looked back in the UFC days. Yeah, 
But after a year sitting out, he was getting kind of desperate. So I can see, you know, he's going to get who's going to work cheap, unfortunately. But you had a great showing that one. That was yeah. one of those things where, you know, uh, you came out really elevated from that because nobody expected, especially his comeback was getting so much attention and uh, you didn't let him look good. What do you no, remember about was, that fight? Um, so I remember, he, I know he was using, he wanted to get into pride and I believe he was using this fight. He was trying to use this fight um, to springboard into to pride. And I think that's why he was trying so hard to get the, the the top names in either Pancras or Rings, because obviously that would give him more exposure. And so, you know, I went into that fight, um, again, excited. Um, I remember bits and pieces of it. And it was, um, you know, the first round was mostly um, a lot of movement. I, I know I was throwing a lot of leg kicks and, you know, we had a few grappling exchanges. Um, I think he, he realized early that, um, obviously, my grappling had in, improved a fair bit. I think at one point um, I had a De La Hever, which didn't even De La Hever didn't exist, but the outside hook position and uh, almost took his back. And um, but yeah, it was just you know it was it was fun because as I said, <coughs> um, he was very nimble, he was very skilled, and he moved really well. It was fluid, so I actually enjoyed. You know, the, the, both the striking and grappling exchanges because it was quite a, a fluid um, match. And I think um, the third round, um, I've managed to reverse him. I, um, I mounted him at one point. I was getting, you know, ground pound. I stupidly went for a mounted triangle, ended up rolling into a triangle, which he escaped out of. And... Um, try to stomp on my head. And then I think we had one point we got into um, a leg lock exchange and coming from Pancras, I don't think he expected me to be well-versed um, in uh, leg attacks, almost heel hooked him. He spun out, I switched to a knee bar. He almost got caught in that. Obviously he got out, kept the round kept going then. But that was, that, that third round was just a high paced, high energy round. And obviously a lot of adrenaline because I had a couple of opportunities where Rick almost finished Frank. Um, so, you know, I, I went into my corner at the end of the third round. I'm like, I, I'm, you know, two weeks notice. I didn't have much time to prepare. I'm like, I'm exhausted. I've got nothing. You know, it's, it's, it's over. And my coach goes, what are you talking about? I've got two more rounds. Shut up. He goes, you've got more than enough gas. Yes. Just go in there and fight. And I just went, oh, okay. I got just, I mean, okay. Who was That's in your it. corner? Sorry? Oh, Anthony Lange, my, my jiu-jitsu coach. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, I think the, the last two rounds <coughs> were more dominant um, for Frank. Nothing particularly amazing happened um, in them, but I think he, he controlled them uh, a bit more. As I said, I, I was pretty gassed um, by that. We still had some good exchanges and, he ended up um, winning the, the decision. He made a good showing. It's one of those things where your stack rises even in a loss. Well, interestingly enough, uh, I, I spoke to him afterwards. because Remember how I said before the fight, he was just non-approachable. Afterwards, he was really cool. We actually became friends. Well, I mean, as much as we, you know, could be, you know, in different continents. But we got on really well. He was a really nice guy. I actually... Gave me a piece of advice. I ended up totally ignoring. So he goes to me. He goes, "If they ever, you, if the UFC ever offers you a fight with um, Jeremy Horn, he goes, don't take it." I'm like, "Why?" And he goes, "Jeremy is one of the most skilled and talented guys out there. He just doesn't get the recognition he deserves. If you lose to him, nobody's going to remember him. Remember you." And if you beat him, nobody's going to care. Um, and I went, oh. And I, I kind of, I, look, I knew Jeremy's skill set, like he poured Minotaur and Aguera, Anderson Silva, put Chuck Liddell to sleep. Obviously lost to Frank, but he was doing really well in that fight up until he got caught um, in that, that knee bar. So I, I knew the talent level um, of Jeremy. Um, but it's funny that he told me that. And then... 
again, two weeks before UFC 30, I got a phone, a phone call at four o'clock in the morning from Joe Silva saying, hey, uh, Cafe Dante's got a hole in his leg through the staff. Um, we've lost our co-main event. Uh, you up for the fight? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, just email me in the morning. And I went back to sleep and I woke up the next day thinking, man, I had the weirdest dream. I just, I dreamt I got into the UFC. Well, it didn't even occur to me to check my phone. Like, it, it, it felt like I had a, it was a dream. And then I kind of went into work and I get onto my computer and there's an email from Joe Silver saying, oh, um, thanks for confirming your fight with Jeremy Horn at UFC 30 at this, in, in two weeks' time. I'm like, fuck, I better call my coach. <laughs> Well, it, it, there's a little caveat today. First and foremost, Frank Shamrock. We had him on a yes. fantastic episode about two or three episodes ago. Um, his vision and understanding of who's going to meet who. We've had Mark Coleman on. He even said, yeah, Frank gave me a warning about Maury Smith. I ignored it. He, he constantly comes up in conversations with giving people warnings of, who would be bad or good matchups for them. Interesting yeah. guy. But Jeremy Horn, you guys were initially supposed to fight. Pardon me? But just before we go into that, it's actually, um, you reminded me of something. Because after our fight, even though I lost and obviously I was disappointed, he came up to me and he goes, look, you put on an amazing performance. He goes, what I do is break people and I couldn't break you. You should be proud about that. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And that's yeah. always kind of stuck with me. So. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, you know, Chris Brennan, privately, he told me, what Frank does is he understands your pace and what your heart rate is, and he goes this much over it until he breaks you because his cardio is a strong point. And like you said, on two weeks' notice, you, you, you push through. Um, but Jeremy Horn, you and Jeremy Horn were supposed to fight January 1st, 2001 uh, for TKO. Am I, is that right or is that wrong? No, so we were supposed to fight uh, at the, the, the UCC, which became TKO the year before. Then they were trying to line up that fight for TKO. But then the UFC offer came in. See, but at a two-week notice... Because February 23rd, 2001 was UFC 30. Either way, I know you were re late replacement. Uh, Alex Dantas was, was the person. Jeremy at the time is 45, 9, and 4. Dana White at one point managed both Tito Ortiz, Chuck Liddell. Horn slept Liddell. I'm and what they're here. trying to do is make an Ortiz-Horn match so Dana can kind of get a little skin back. Well, it, was his... also, it was also because um, at the time, everyone was saying that, you know, Ortiz has beaten everyone. Jeremy's the guy to beat him. He's well-rounded enough. He's got the grappling. He's got the striking. Um, he's so well-rounded. Experience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, he'd already faced the Minotaur and Nogueira. He'd already faced Anderson Silva. Had already um, faced Frank Shamrock and... And as I said, already faced Chuck. So he was, not only did he have a huge list of opponent, like he had a massive fight record, in there were some quality, quality opponents. Maybe he didn't beat them all, but there were some very quality opponents and he put in really good performances on all yes. of them. So it was both, you know, obviously Dana had his agenda, but, the, the fans were calling for it too. They, this is the fight they, they wanted to see, you know, Tito, Tito versus Jeremy. And I was just supposed to come in to build. Um, Jeremy, Jeremy Orton, the match. Yeah. yeah. Now I was supposed to, I kind of overheard this um, because I was the guy, because Jeremy lost to Frank and then Frank couldn't put me away. They thought Jeremy would be able to put me away. So they would kind of sell it as, you know, oh, Jeremy beat the guy that Frank couldn't beat. So therefore he now deserves a shot at Tito and because Frank had already beaten Tito as well. So I was kind of 
put in, you know, I know Joe and I know he wasn't like doing it negatively. Like he, he knew I was a, a legit talent, but it wasn't You were the about, B-side. You were the B-side. Yeah, I was the For B-side. sure. Like there was always the opportunity. He always knew that if I won, I was a good, I, I was, uh, you know, marketable. I had the Australian market. All that sort of, yeah. I knew that. So it was a risk worth taking for them. You know, well, they let, lose- let me let me interject also. Ninety percent of your career, you've come in as the B side. I think, yeah, nearly all my career, but because yeah. you're never at home, you're never at home. You're always somewhere else. So it's no big deal to you. No. Nah. Um, interesting story um, is so you remember Full Contact Fighter, the paper. Yeah, Joe Gold. Yeah, he listens. Yep. Joe Gold listens to the podcast. There you go, Joe. So we always used to get it in Australia, but we would always get it weeks after the events were on. So we would kind of read it, but we would still get them because we'd want to, you know, see of course. So there were still interesting articles and things like that. <clears throat> but we never got the, the 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 preview forecast before a fight. So this time I'm in I'm in um, New Jersey. Uh, interesting Trump Taj Mahal. So. <clears throat> First time it's been sanctioned by an athletic commission. First show that Zupa have gotten on board. And I'm in the casino and I see a full contact fighter sitting on one of the tables. I'm like, oh, it's a current one. And it's actually for this event. I'm like, oh, I get to read it. So they normally they they get they normally put in uh, <laughs> predictions. For the main and co-main event. Now, um, Tito <laughs> was fighting um, what was his, um, Evan Tanner, yeah. and it was at the time the predictions were like 50-50 because people were like, you know, <clears throat> Evan Tanner's got the clinch, the knees, the elbows. You know, where Tito's strong, he's also really strong. So the predictions were kind of 50-50. You go to mine, my um predictions or mine and Jeremy's I should say every single person predicted that Jeremy would win <clears throat> the majority of them I think there was one that particularly that stood out that said Jeremy would win by under in under three minutes by submission so I made it my goal in that fight to submit him in under three minutes and it took me two minutes and 59 seconds so not going to lie to you. I'm a Midwest guy. I'm from Chicago. Okay. I've seen Jeremy Horn fight on the independent circuit. I don't know. Over a dozen times. You hurt my feelings that night, Elvis. I'm not going to lie. I heard a lot of people's feelings that night. (laughs) Well, the thing about it too, is it's interesting when you think about mindset because Jeremy's a guy who was very used to being an underdog. Also, you know, there's Frank against, you know, you meant you ran through it and and that was part of his thing too. Even on the on the B circuit, baby face, you know, not not much of a muscular body, you know. Little a lot doughy. of people underestimated him. He said this was one of the first fights, the big. This was the first big fight where he wasn't the underdog. And yeah. well, he messed his head up. Zombie, it? Yeah, he shit the bed. I mean, there's no other word way to say it. <laughs> in our in our interview with Jeremy, he even said he's like, this is the, "I'm in the biggest organization. This is my goal." And I'm not the underdog. It was like a difficult position for him to be in. Yeah. yeah. But he complimented. He took his hat off to you. I mean, you got him. And, yeah. and he was not oh, making look, excuses I, about as it. As I said, so. I have a, a ton of respect for Jeremy. And <clears throat> I've kind of tried to tell you. I tried to tell him afterwards. And I told, I know what he's been through. I know who he's fought. I know what his skill level is. I know that he was the the underdog before I was the underdog. Um, I have a ton of respect. I don't think he got half the recognition he really deserved uh, during his career. Uh, and again, if you look at the numbers, oh, the fuck, shit, even with the numbers, he's, he's a stupidly ridiculous um, career. Yeah, no, guy, guy's a legend of the sport, and I think he, he needs more recognition for that. Yeah, yeah. We've done a couple of interviews with him. He's a fast. He dumped on Frank Shamrock, gave you lots of compliments. So, and, you know, it's unfortunate that Chris is here because you caught him in a triangle armbar 
which yes. later very innovative for its time. Lido used that several times in the future with uh, finishing opponents. It was a uh, hell of a submission then. Yeah, I, um, it was actually a modified one because the second hand was kind of in. Um, I think now they, they call it a um, dead or orchard. Um, and Danaher, interestingly enough, goes, no, it's the dead Elvis because he did it first. So. Hey, you're very innovative. Yeah. You're very innovative. Yeah, I think, uh, look, I didn't have much of a choice. Um, because back in the day, there was no black belt jiu-jitsu players in the country. I, you know, my coach, Anthony Langy, was amazing, but he was only just a step ahead of me. So um, I had to <clears throat> discover a lot of stuff just on the mat, um, watching fight tapes, because obviously we didn't have the ability to, to purchase, download instructionals. There were no DVDs. There were some VHS instructionals out there, but they're all very basic. Um, obviously, I was a big part of the tape trading era. I'm sure um, you guys remember that, where the way we built the sport is trading tapes and um, sending events for instructional, sending instructionals for events. You know, so um, I would get, I would try and watch as much stuff. I watched the, the, the Brazilian um, fight stuff. I watched the Japanese stuff. I watched, obviously, the UFC, the hook and shoot stuff. Um, I tried to watch everything I could, um, you know, checked out Sambo instructional, Judo instructional, Jiu-Jitsu. I mean, it was all very fundamental, but it at least gave me a, a good grasp and understanding. And I just played. Really, that's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I played on the mat and that's kind of what I've kind of even taken across to, you know, how I teach now. I try and, you know, get people to enjoy and play. And this is how you're going to improve if you focus too much on just you know competitions play you know if you want to make it a career if you want to be innovative you have to play <clears throat> you know the difference between you and eddie bravo you know I, I, obviously you've got the fight background he's a jiu-jitsu background yeah. is he would name his play yeah like the little play that he did put different names to it where you did it and I, I think you were so far ahead of your time as compared to everybody else. I think if you just kind of, you know, we got mission control, we got seatbelt. If you would have kind of went down that same path, I think you would have had your own little jujitsu brand. And, and you know, I, I, I think well, it I definitely, I look back and I wonder, um, I even, um, when I went to the world championships uh, for jujitsu world masters in 2014, I developed a position called side guard, which I've been playing with, <clears throat> but I didn't want to tell anyone about it um, until I pulled it off at the, you know, at world class level. So, you know, and even then I still haven't, like the plan was once I did it there, I would then release an instruction. I still haven't got around to doing that. So <laughs> maybe down the track. Yeah, you know, you're, you're very innovative. It's, it's incredibly impressive. And also you were also very vocal on the underground forum as well. Yeah. Like you I lived on that thing. Yeah, no, like I, I was lucky because I, again, one of the ways I sold myself back in the day was the world's toughest nerd. <clears throat> so I used to, um, well, I was an IT guy. I, I came up to the IT ground um, and I was, you know, considered a nerd. I played Dungeons and Dragons when I was in high school <laughs> and stuff. So it was, yeah, it was a good, oh, it was fun. So, but I sold myself as kind of, uh, the world's toughest nerd to kind of kind of push that. But yeah, it was again just um still just play and, and that sort of stuff. It's interesting. Yeah, Crowbar is one of the guys that actually I've got a lot going on right now. He pretty, he's very active on the forums as he was back then when you were posting yeah. there. And he helped me with a lot of this information, a lot of the research that we got in this interview in particular is actually from the underground forum. A lot of the stuff that we read, the little tidbits, the little I nerdy things. That we up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I got a question for you Re really fast. Let's sneak this one in. Where, where did the nickname come from? King of rock and rumble. What, what, what what's the story I mean, behind obviously it? Obviously it's, it's, it's built off Elvis Presley. the king of rock and roll. Now I don't remember if it was 
the commentators on the first on that first event I fought in, or whether it was the um, the press afterwards when they were writing it up. At somewhere at that point, somebody has termed uh, the king of rock and rumble. And again, you don't make up your nick nicknames; they get given to you. So it pretty much um, stuck with me from that point. And one of the things I picked up was the finger point. Uh, you know, and then I stuck it with you know, it's good to be the king and when I get photos with people, I do the point rather than the fist or the, um, <clears throat> the shaka. So where the finger point actually came from was I just beaten Jeremy and I'm sitting there. I'm elated. Like, oh, you have no idea. Like the UFC was my goal. I finally made it. I won. I'm, I'm waiting for them to put up my hand. I'm just standing there, literally bees in my um, bonnet. And I look down. And there's a cameraman sitting there. Like, I think he was kind of filming me and stuff. And then he kind of drops to his knees to film up before the hands go up. And I've just looked straight down the camera and I've gone. It's just a reaction. I was like, yep. And then the UFC took that, put it on the end of their video game montage, um, put it in their ads at the time that were going on pay-per-view. So suddenly they're doing, you know, people getting knocked out, people getting slammed, people getting submitted, hands getting raised. And then at the very end, the finger point. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I should keep that. And so yeah. it kind of stuck with me ever cool. since. Yeah. You, well, we, we, they, we, they didn't pay you for that video montage, I bet. No. No. <laughs> I, I, that, yeah, no. <laughs> my UFC game video character. We know what Randy went through to try and get that to happen. Eh, it's just... It is what it is. Yeah. yeah they're, they're, now, their contracts are good. They're good lawyers. Yeah. I hate to be rude. Um, I actually do have to run, so I've got to pick up my son from daycare. Um, I'm more than happy to do a follow-up if you want to do another one later on, because obviously we've only gotten partway through things. It, it, uh, it, it, Elvis, I have to tell you, like, and I, and I agree, the following fighters are fucking insane. Like, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop, bro. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. It's like um, I kind of look back and even I have to kick myself sometimes. I'm like the amount of either current or future world champions that ended up on the list. I'm like, man, I, you know, I had a pretty good career. It was fun. Well, Mike, we were down under again and we got Elvis Sinisic in the books. I'm, I think, you know, history has been served. Definitely a historic guy and a historic character too. A good guy. Well, I think what I like most one, the guy can talk and he comes with stories. He's got about 19 fights. Every single one of them is a little crazy. So like that, that's always kind of fun for us, but out of like the pioneer class, he's somebody that got respect at the time and continued to get it afterward. Like he's got his own gym, Kings MMA. Um, he also owns one of the UFC gyms, uh, I think in Brisbane, I think is what they said. Um, so he's heavily involved with the sport. You know, he's, he's continuing to participate in it. And it's just, it's nice to see somebody that kept falling forward. Yeah. And we got to have him back to finish his career up. So we have to, know. we have to dude. So yeah, that's, Miguel, that's something I'm looking forward to. So crowbar, we, we did this thing kind of here i'm not gonna say last minute i got a lot of personal stuff going on just had a kid i'm in denver right now for bkfc and um crowbar from the underground forum really really helped me out in regards to researching this kind of gave me those little bells and whistles that make people understand that man we really looked into your life before we started the interview so a big shout out to him um as well as ladies and gentlemen if you're like just as jaded as we are MixedMartialArts.com has got an underground forum. I, I go there just kind of perusing around. I don't post there. Um, it's a fantastic one to go to, much better than Reddit. But Reddit's where we get our views. So if you can also post our stuff there, it'd be great. So, Miguel, we got another Australian under, under our belt. Uh, in our top 10 cities, two Australian cities, Brisbane and Queensland, or Sydney, Sydney, Queensland, Brisbane. I'm never going to get it right. Um, they're in our top 10. So it's Elvis nice. Citizen is yep. in the books. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.